All right, it's Jake here. We are doing our tour, our winter grazing tour, trying to highlight some uh, how the system works. We got goats working here on a site here at Center Point Energy, and we're just going to go as we walk through the land, point out certain spots, and we have some people to ask some questions that have uh, questions about the process, and we'll see how that goes. So right now, you can see right behind me here, we've got a buckthorn that uh, is girdled or has bark stripped around and the goats are still working on this one. And throughout the tour, we're gonna to show different ones, different species that uh, the bark has been taken off by the goats and how effective that could be in certain sites. Hi, I'm Katie Marchetto, and I'm a researcher at the University of Minnesota. And um, we're out here studying the effects that the goats have on buckthorn. And the reason it's a concern for people in Minnesota is buckthorn is considered by the state to be a noxious weed meaning that it has detrimental effects on the environment. And um, it's kind of hard to control using traditional methods. Um, so we really want to understand how things, sort of alternative methods like using goats could help be part of a, uh, the toolkit for dealing with uh, buckthorn and other invasive plants. We're basically studying um, how the different actions by the goats uh, affect plants of uh, different sizes. Um, so in during the normal growing season, um, the goats defoliate the plants. And then in the winter, um, the goats strip bark, strip off buds, and they go after the fruits. Originally, we hadn't really expected that they would be so interested in the fruits. We'd go to events and um, people would actually come up to us and ask us, um, we, see, we see these goats eating these fruits. What, what's going on with that? Could they be dispersing them when they move to another site? Um, so it was something that sort of sprung from conversations we had with other people. Um, the sort of study that we did to look at the uh, effect of the goats eating the berries. The way we did the study was we we essentially put some diapers on some of the goats and uh, we fed them a known number of buckthorn fruits and then we collected their poop. So we found out that um, most of the seeds do get destroyed uh, as the goats are eating them. They aren't a big dispersal risk and actually um, they're pretty good at just getting rid of the seeds in general. Overall, we're trying to study uh, the effects of the goats on all of the life cycle of the plant. So uh, from seeds to, you know, these big, tall plants. Um, so this is sort of a, a piece of how we are uh, at the university attempting to apply scholarly expertise to community problems. So normally we do our research in the summer. We're looking not only at buckthorns, but also the effect of goat browsing on plant community composition as a whole. So the thing that gets us out here in the cold Minnesota winter is actually looking at some of the effects that the goats have, particularly at this time of year. Um, so in the uh, late fall and the winter, um, the goats will strip bark and buds off of the plants. Uh, so this is one of the um, plants that they've stripped the bark um, all the way around on. Um, and that um, was something called girdling. So the living part of the of a woody plant is actually just the outer part. That's where all of the water and the nutrients and the sugar flow. So um, if that gets stripped off, then that essentially disconnects the top of the stem from the roots. So the top of the stem should die off. So um, we think that that will have a bigger impact impact on some of these larger individuals than um, just defoliating and stripping the leaves off does. So we're here in the middle of the buckthorn thicket and Caleb's got some questions here that we're going to talk about on the video. All right, well my first question was, you know, we can see that the goats are chewing the bark off or girdling the buckthorn here. Uh, for next year, what do you expect? Is it going to resprout at the ground level, up at the leaves, or some yeah. partial no, resprout? Uh, that's a good question. So, like for this tree, it's a nice straight trunk. We don't have the branching, and they look what well, about two or three feet that they've chewed all the way around it. This we find is completely top killed, crispy next year, which is awesome. 
because uh, a lot of these ones, I don't know what you, how old you guess. I mean, you cut the rings maybe five to ten years old. I don't know. It's hard to say, especially inside the canopy here. But what we usually will see, you now next year, is they'll re-sprout. So if the goats stop right about here, we'll see about 10 to 15 shoots coming off at the re-sprout height there. So what's really great about that is then this opens up this site to be uh, more of the warm season. So right now we're talking about the cool season, but I like to think of it as a woodland reset. So in the summertime, they don't uh, chew the bark or they don't like to girdle. There's a lot of other stuff that's much more nutritious at the time that they're working on. So uh, see if he's gonna eat some there. Oh, beautiful. Um, I don't know if you catch that or not. <laughs> But they almost know like they're saying, come on guys. All right, so anyway, so this will re-sprout and then we can hit that in the summertime. Or if we keep them on a cool season rotation, next winter we can come back and then they'll girdle all of these nice uh, re-sprouts. And I found that after two years that just, so this, uh, this already does phenomenal work in my opinion. I mean, we're re resetting a buckthorn, difficult to get in a thicket on a hill. We're re resetting this tree, you know, we've got about, say, 10 years of growth here. We're resetting it back 10 years. Then we come back the next year and hit those re-sprouts. And after that second year, this thing's really like, they're really hurting, especially if you can get them to girdle it twice. Or you just keep them in that low and slow, and as long as it's lower, then we're, it just keeps the site, we can, continue to work on the site year round. Sometimes if the schedule allows, we'll do more summer work, sometimes more winter work. But, uh, and another thing too, when you walk through this, when you're looking through here, you'll see that some are nice and beautifully stripped and some are not. One of them, one reason is that we just haven't got to them all yet. As you see, Jack right here is just showing that, hey, I'm, I'll get that one for you, boss. Um, but, so like this one, for an example, you look at this and you're like, hey, they missed this one, but I always go around and then just break them crispy it's already dead they know it they don't waste their time to eat it they can, I don't know how they do it or sense it or if it's the when they're sniffing it because I you would think you would see chew marks on some of this uh, dead stuff but they don't even chew it or even make an attempt so obviously they can tell what tissue is still alive and they work on the ones that are alive and then the process of having these goats you know we've got about a hundred here constantly moving through this woods every day their, their body movements are knocking and they're busting these over and breaking these up. So they just uh, open it up even with, and it's, even with their body movements, I guess. So that's what I really love about this is they're, they're eating the bark, they're chewing that, they're resetting them at back. And then the, the dead stuff or the down stuff, this, the, with their body movements, are opening it up and making it easier for us to walk through and do further management. Or you can have some volunteers do some follow-up work or just keep it on the GOAT schedule. You got a lot of options when you're doing it that way. And uh, one thing I will note, we don't have any right here and we'll get it later in the video as we're walking around but so if this was a clump say someone cut this and it's not just a straight branch say you have four or five coming off sometimes it's hard for the goats to get all the way around every individual one because they're actually growing into each other so what we find on those instead of being a hundred percent crispy they'll be maybe one or two branches that still, that the, the, the sugars get up through that still keeps it going. But we find that they kind of fade out after time. They're not happy. And then if not next winter, they'll, mix, they'll try to get, say like this spot right here, they maybe, if this went all the way down so that the sugars and the saps can run, they'll maybe get that next year. Or that maybe be one reason to do some follow up with the human crew, just to kind of notch some of those, just to make sure you get them. But, those are the only ones that we find, but as you'll see in the video here, there's some of them that have 10, 20 branches and they really do a good job of getting around those, but sometimes they just limited where they can get to. So these nice, big, tall, straight ones that are already growing, these are just really ripe for the picking for this uh, winter girdling. So yeah, another question I had was, you know, you talked about girdling and making these re-sprout, but you still have these large buckthorn that are uh, gonna be standing um, well, what do you recommend to land managers uh, long term, you know, a couple of years down the road who don't want maybe all the, the dead standing material around, kind of creating a mess and making navigation yeah. difficult? Yeah, good question. So what, what I recommend, it, it all depends on where you're at. So like this area, we're way back off the trail. We're not right behind the city hall and we've got a little bit more freedom. I, up until now, I, I'd argue, um, a lot of this land is just kind of put on the back burner like we're not even dealing with it. We got enough stuff to work out right out front and center. 
Um, so if that's the case, like this. So this is a back part of the property. It's not right, uh, right up by the main gate or the door or, or a lot of travel going through here. We can just let these sit and they make great, you know, bird habitat. We see a lot of, you know, your, uh, your uh, pollinators and insects find good spots to kind of hang out in the winter time. So I like to let them, and, it, and it's just so much less work to, to cut them down. And they really don't need to be cut down now because they've already been reset and uh, we're gonna be re-sprouting at the base. But what we find, and it works really well, is uh, a minimum of three years. So they girdle this, it's re-sprouts, we're eating in a couple years. Then what I like to do on like what we do around our, our place or other places, if you have the ability, so like in this flat area, just come through in the winter time. We, uh, we use a bobcat when the ground's frozen so we're not disturbing the soil. But you can come right along and they just shear right off just beautifully at the ground level. I don't know how to describe it. They just, they just snap right off so they're because they're dead for a couple years. And then you're not tripping over stumps. You push them all in a pile. And you, if people want to burn it at that point or keep it for wildlife habitat or bird habitat, that's cool. But it's just, instead of trying to fight them and cut them and grind them and all that, it's just the, the stumps slowly kind of release, uh, kind of break down naturally over time is what we find. The last question was, uh, you know, we can see looking around that they're uh, chewing on some trees or shrubs, but not others. Uh, what are the, the trees and shrubs that they seem to girdle the most yep. in the winter? Yeah, so, you know, right now we got Speckles and Jack working on that, uh, that big one there. And you see, it's usually the really healthy ones or ones that have a little bit of green leaves on them yet. Um, for some reason, they really love those. So they can kind of tell the ones that uh, um, they kind of gravitate to those buckthorn first. There's some buckthorn in here that are really getting shaded out or struggling or got really shaggy bark and and they kind of leave those, uh, you know, they're really going after the really the strongest ones, which is really nice. Um, as terms of other trees, you know, we've got a lot of other, uh, you know, you know, the oak tree, bur oak tree with the big, thick, shaggy bark. And again, this is kind of our premises of kind of going this, this is trees uh, investment into being protected from being girdled. So it has really thick bark. We don't see them going after the, the nice, uh, bigger uh, your oak trees, your cottonwood trees, even some hackberry. We've got some bigger hackberry back, back here. Um, one thing I will warn people out is they do love cherry trees. So your black cherry, especially your younger ones, you just gotta watch those. And what we're finding in most woodland systems in Minnesota, everything is just way over choked already. Even, even cherries are over choked with each other. So first getting this initial opening and clearing, get your buckthorn out, get your young stuff out. If you got some taller seed sources, you know, then for further forest management, you can kind of work to kind of work to protect to make sure you got a good distribution of other species of, of trees. But um, I would say, your black, like I said, the black cherries, they really love them. Um, and uh, they really love going after Siberian elm, black locust, sumac, prickly ash. Prickly ash is one is even a year round one. And black locust, prickly ash and sumac we're now getting them to girdle that year round um, so they still hit it in the winter time pretty good but there's some that we get in the summertime too while we're also doing other other work on other species of plants and then uh yeah, and then every, it, and I think that also has to do with kind of the photo, you know, where the tree is at in its life cycle. So like the ones on the edge, they're, uh, they're a little bit ahead of the ones deep in the woods. So they might girdle the ones on the edge first, and then as they move in, these ones are a little bit more behind because they didn't get enough sun, as much sunlight, so they're a little bit more delayed, and then they kind of work their way into the woods a little bit more is just kind of, a, kind of my just observation, but then, you know, sometimes it's random. I think, you know, hey, Jack's just standing right there. There's a buckthorn there. He's got nothing else to do. I'm just chewing the bark. So I think there's just some, it's not all totally calculated. There is some randomness to it. So it makes it a, a good for management to keep it kind of random that way too. So I got Caleb Ashling here from the city of Burnsville. I've known Caleb, I don't know how many years now? Five years? Yeah, something like that. Uh, we've worked on projects throughout the city and um, he was uh, very involved with the uh, ordinance or policy change in Burnsville. 
And so I, I wanted to have him talk a little bit about that uh, process because there's a lot of other cities out there uh, and uh, counties that are looking to maybe use goats as a tool and some outdated language on uh, some of the policies are, are still out there and just the easiest way to make uh, the process uh, just, just be overall easy for everybody and also uh, finding towns where they can actually get bids from goat companies and then also just uh, making it easy and that we uh, make sure the, the cities uh, comfortable and uh, they feel that the, the public are safe and, and that type of stuff. But uh, this thought we'd just talk kind of about that process here, especially at Center Point Energy. Uh, when we first, just a little background on this spot. Um, we're in Burnsville here. Center Point Energy has been really doing a lot to try to uh, enhance the habitat around this uh, Dakota Station plant. And I think they contacted maybe four or five years ago about wanting to use goats. So I came out here, I walked the site and, and said, yes, this is a beautiful spot to have goats. There's a lot of steep hills, a lot of buckthorn, uh, ready to give them an estimate and a quote. And then we kind of just checked in, uh, just did our homework and checked in with the city. And I don't know if, if Caleb was at that time or wasn't not saying it was him saying yes or no, but just basically in the policy, it said that, you know, we, goats are not allowed in the city of Burnsville at this time. So we just kind of put the project on hold, went and contacted some people from the city and since then the city tried using goats a little bit uh, worked with our company and just to kind of get a little background on that and then we've got uh, and now we're able to work here and uh, hopefully be working here for many years and it's been going really well and just kind of wanted to show this kind of process and model with you I don't know if that's the same story you remember or not uh, yeah I think that's about the same story that I remember uh, so yeah a couple you know the city's been interested in goats as a potential management tool uh, to kind of put in our toolbox for different land management activities so we started the pilot project as you mentioned a couple years ago and uh, we uh, had a good trial year with our pilot project so we went ahead to change the ordinances over this past winter the winter of 2008 uh, 2018 2019 uh, and kind of our first process for that was trying to identify where within the ordinance we wanted to make an amendment. Uh, so we looked at our uh, ordinances, what was in place currently, and we identified the uh, animal section of the code as the best place to, to put that change. Uh, so what we did uh, was we had one exception already to kind of the normal rules related to animals that allowed uh, uh, some livestock, a horse, uh, horses, and other types of animals in a small area of Burnsville. Uh, so we had an exception for that already, so we added an additional exception within that section of the code for prescribed grazing. Uh, so within that section of the code, it, it identifies prescribed grazing as uh, allowed under ordinance as long as there's a contractor with a permit from the city to do it. Uh, so that was uh, how we decided to allow it under ordinance. Uh, but we wanted to have more of a structure that regulated the specifics of uh, what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. Uh, so to do that, we developed a policy, which was also passed through City Council. Uh, and we felt the policy format was a good way for us to uh, have some flexibility to change rules as prescribed grazing kind of developed as a practice in the suburban environment. Uh, so the policy format uh, lays out some some of the most important rules uh, we didn't want to set up a policy that regulated every little thing that uh, you know was related to prescribed grazing but we wanted to pr provide a good structure uh, to make sure that there weren't issues developing related to prescribed grazing activities uh, so what we did was identify uh, the number of well first probably the most important was what size lot prescribed grazing could occur on uh, in burnsville and what we felt most comfortable with um, and then other things like how many animals were, were going to be allowed depending on the size of the grazing area, uh, how often, how long they could stay, uh, how often they could return, um, and then the fencing setup, what types of fencing were, uh, would be allowed uh, on, the, on the projects. Um, and that's kind of the basic way that we set up our policy was trying to lay out those most important structures, uh, but to have some flexibility in there as well to, to realize that there are probably situations that we might not anticipate when we're developing and we could kind of deal with those as they uh, come. Um, and then I think the last part of our ordinance was to figure out how to manage the contractors that would be doing this in town. 
Uh, so what we decided to do was to, to use a process similar to what we do with uh, tree contractors. Uh, we have a permit process, so a, a, a grazing contractor like yourself, as you know, uh, will apply for an annual permit with the city. It's a free permit. Um, and uh, basically the contractors have to read through all of our policy and they have to you know, sign off that they're going to follow the rules that we have set up. And we also check insurance requirements. Uh, so we want to make sure that contractors have adequate insurance to deal with any you know, potential, even if unlikely situation that could arise. Uh, so we verify that they meet our insurance requirements. Uh, and then we also request that when they're coming into town for a project, they let us know so we can be in the loop on uh, what's going on uh, in Burnsville related to goats. Um, so that's kind of the basic process we had for contractors. Uh, we felt that it would be you know, easier to uh, work with the contractors rather than you know, having residents try to figure out all of the rules related to the ordinance. Uh, we preferred to try to uh, put that onus, onus on the contractors to make sure they knew the policy and they could relay, relay that information to residents when they're coming into town to do work. Sure. And uh, one thing I think you're kind of doing uh, differently, I just talking about the difference between a policy and an ordinance, I guess, and how that, I guess I, I don't know how that works exactly. And is it, is it more difficult to pass or within the city or I, I like that flexibility you guys are leaving there, but um, I think you're the first one I was kind of looking at was more of a policy change, but then also had kind of some guidelines or I guess, how would you describe that to other cities versus an all out ordinance change? I guess I'm trying to think of the difference. Or. Yeah, I think there's, uh, when we worked as a team, you know, different departments coming together to figure out how to do this, uh, you know, the ordinance, we needed to have something in the ordinance uh, that would allow it. But if there were future changes that we needed to do uh, to kind of modify the process uh, as it developed, uh, that policy format was going to be a little easier to adjust okay. uh, just as far as, you know, background work into changing the process. Speaking of that, just putting you right alive on the spot, what if, if we did say want to modify some stuff like right now or some different things or say especially with this winter stuff that we're, we're going to be talking about today, like uh, how do you see that process going or does it have to go back to revote or trying to keep it, you know, really easy on the city staff and that kind of stuff too. I guess I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it would have to go back and uh, the pot policy would have to be modified, uh, but there's just a little different process for that modification okay. um, than if it was uh, a full ordinance change okay. or amendment. Okay. Now with this winter browsing or cool season browsing, I wanted to talk about bedding and shelter and that kind of topic that comes up. So. What we have here behind us is the goat bedding area on this property. So I think we have, I don't know, close to 30-ish plus or minus acres that are fenced off here. And what I find really interesting is just really, and in just raising goats in general, is just when you sit back, kind of watch them, let them talk to you, let them tell you um, where they want to be and, and that type of stuff. So on this site here, they found this spot and the reason I think they like it is because you kind of see there's a hill in the background. Um, it kind of keeps the, the prevailing winds. They're kind of down in a little gully here. We also have like a, a, a commercial building kind of on this side here and I think they kind of also kind of like to be near people. And the reason I think they really like this spot, and it's kind of hard to tell, it's a little cloudier day, but this is one of the first spots in the morning that gets that first glimpse of sun. Those first sun rays are coming down and they're getting that solar heating effect uh, coming back here. So what I like to do is kind of let the goats say, hey, this is what we like to hang out. And then on certain sites, we will just add some bedding here. So this, we have some bean straw. I like to use bean straw because I'm not worrying about it sprouting or coming invasive or anything like that and it's really nice and fine and good to work with. So the goats are hanging out in this bean straw area here. They go out to work and they come back and uh, they really do extra extra good job around their bedding area because they're hanging out here most of the time or they're just kind of ruminating and chilling here. So it uh, works out really well. Uh, and we're able to kind of move move these bedding areas around if we want to to kind of keep them moving on uh, on the uh, around the landscape to spread out the the nutrients, and we find that they're just much more happy and healthy, less chance of piling, say getting confined in a barn or something like that where they get uh, um, smothered. 
And another thing to, I don't recommend this just practice in general for everyday goat uh, keepers. There are definitely goats that belong in a barn and there are definitely goats that are more conditioned for doing this type of work. And we've been working at this for many, many years to try to find the ones that, uh, that are comfortable out working um, in the wintertime. So what we really look for and what we're selecting for with our breeding program when, when we sell goats to people, uh, we really love the Spanish goat breed and really looking for the ones that really have heavy cashmere. Uh, when, when, I, when we grab a goat here, there are certain ones we've had here for six, seven years that don't that just they just have it I don't you know I don't know how to describe it but they they just know how to do well and thrive in the winter time and then there's some that when I catch them I pull their 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 hair back I really look down it should be almost like a wool thick heavy blanket and I shouldn't be able to see skin if I'm trying to if I have a good new goat then I'm going to see if it's going to make it through the winter or do well in the winter just really look at that uh, coat and then see which ones are shivering on the coldest days that come out and i'm always kind of listening to what the goats are talking to us or telling us you know if they're shivering a lot if uh, they're losing weight then they're then we send them south so uh, this year another class of goats that uh, always just aren't as comfortable you can get them to stay in in the winter time but you just have to really put some extra bedding and extra supplemental feed are the kids. So this year's kid crop, October, boom, they're all down in Kansas. And the last I checked the other day, it's gonna be like 50 degrees in Kansas where they're at. And they just, just hang out down there and then they'll come back up in the spring. And then we have another cut, some of the ones that are adults that worked into the fall or just early part of December, just the other day, sent another load south of ones that I didn't feel had the fur coat, I felt didn't, uh, when you feel them, they just felt a little bit thinner. Uh, they just didn't really have a lot of energy. So those ones, again, shipped themselves to uh, hang out in uh, our southern uh, facilities that, uh, so then they can come back up in the spring. And sometimes you can tell on a goat exactly which ones are gonna do well, and sometimes you just gonna have to wash. And we've gone through, a little, this, this December here in Minnesota has been rather cold. We've already went through a couple below zero nights and stuff, so got a pretty good idea which ones are gonna do it, like Ace. Ace is actually, I don't know if we can get him to come up on camera here if you just wanna pan over to him. This goat, been with me, a weather, it's been with me for a long time. One of the, probably one of the best specimens of the goat that I, I don't know, he must have known I'm just going to talk about him or whatever, but um, I don't know if he, he, you can just see on his neck there, just, just that really fuzzy undercoat, really nice and thick, and uh, he just does an excellent job. He just and always has a lot of fat on his back, and uh, if I could have a thousand goats like Ace, I'd be happy, and maybe one day we'll get there, but the only problem with weathers is they don't have babies so but uh, weathers do really really well with this type of work but again just just looking at that and he's one of our babies that we've bred for that you can see when you're looking at him his tail is like up and kind of curved back and uh, yeah he, so he's he's doing good and he, he knows his job and really thrives in the winter time here this goat right here this, uh, this brown one here this one's a new one for this year this is a Sawyer nanny that we're going to be, that we have bred, that we're going to be selling uh, this coming year. But uh, again, it, it's kind of hard to tell on her, but she just has a really, almost like a, just a thick, downy wool blanket that you can just feel. And you look at her and she's not shivering and, and we're, we're shivering here. We got uh, some camera crew and everybody's got uh, hand warmers in our gloves and, and, their, and whatnot. But uh, these guys are, uh, are doing good. So... And then just open air, we also found in the past when we brought all the goats back and we congregate them and fed them hay, that they were just saying, hey, you know, they're wasting the hay, they're, uh, they're not eating it like they should, we're having to feed, we're having to use more medications because they're crowded and you have more coccidosis and that type of stuff. We get them on the landscape, we get them moving around, get them in these different bedding zones. We just find that we have so much uh, less problems of, and not having to treat them uh, uh, for these types of things. Just Again, just spreading the animals out, putting them, and they're getting a lot of good exercise. They're getting good movement, uh, moving through this land here and working on a lot of these plants that we're having problems with.
So here we have Jack. It's a dairy goat. You know, he's got a good, a decent undercoat, but not the thickest one in the world, but he th still thrives. Someone, we don't, we never dehorn our goats. We love horns because they use their horns to help scratch the bark. Um, but someone dehorned him wrong, so we got to keep trimming it because it was uh, when he was young. We got this one at an auction. And then we also have, uh, she'll let me stay here. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Okay. And we got Flower here, who's in, so, in a normal breeding goat, probably husbandry would have called this, got rid of this goat, but look at these horns. So they're coming around, they're curling, they're coming back at you. They're still not touching the tissue, so she's comfortable, but, um, She's a great worker. She's been with us for many years. So it's just showing that it's not all about how you look or your growth rate or how much uh, average daily gain you are to make our herd. It's that you know how to work, that you stay in the fence, you stay alive, and you're happy. And again, she's kind of a, I think, kind of a dairy cross. Again, too, shouldn't be doing as well, but... They're, they, she's still doing okay. So our and thriving in the winter time, Jack is teaching all of our other goats on how to really girdle. We got speckles. He he's another story in himself. Uh, a, a girl donated him to me. Uh, said she wanted to go to a good home. Uh, when I first got him, he was getting out left and right, and uh, it was just a real pain. And then uh, after I don't know a couple months or a year. Now he's just super chill, one of the herd leaders now. Again, kind of a dairy dairy uh, breed. He doesn't have any horns. Normally I wouldn't have bought a goat without horns because I love horns just for handling. And I think that, like again, they really help. But see him, I mean, he's still stripping the bark. He's still getting it done. He doesn't have horns. But uh, so just showing that all goats are, uh, are welcome and accepted in uh, and this and there's a lot of class of goats and a lot of rare breeds that don't make good dairy goats or don't make good meat goats but they make great conservation goats great uh, brush control goats great all that type of stuff so it's just a whole new category and I think it's just really good for the goats in general to have that option and be valued for that option and help drive money and and get we're getting all kinds of uh, getting some studies done and where normally goat, there's not a lot of studies going on goats but just putting goats in a new highlight and I think this animal is just going to completely really excel especially in our area you see all around the country I'm networked with a lot of other companies and and a lot of people are just really seeing the value of using goats and how people use goats different in different environments and how we're using goats you know instead of running and and throwing everybody in a barn in the winter here we're embracing our our minnesota heritage here and being out and working and and staying fresh so when we hit the uh we hit the season running in the summertime the extra busy season but also just uh just trying to show you know what if you were a goat would you rather be out here with all your friends all these acres of land pulling all this stuff eating up high not eating down low eating old hay that you're wasting that you're that goats are peeing and pooping on where they get to be upright and uh be, just allowing a goat to be a goat and it's just a great thing great thing to watch all right now we're in an area it's a little prairie opening and uh, we got some black locusts that have been uh, moving in this prairie area and you can see how good a job they're doing stripping the bark on these in the summertime we did get we find that they also will strip the bark of black locusts pretty readily in the summertime but uh, in the winter time we're taking it to even a deeper level larger diameter and uh, yeah they just love this uh, love the bark of this plant so here's another tree that uh, a lot of land managers are uh, challenged with it's Siberian elm and you can see that they're really going to town there's a lot of fresh tracks here so they're just freshly working on this one but all of these here and even when we were in the summertime late fall they really hit these uh siberian elm but again just taking it to another level in this cool season we're getting even the bigger larger diameter ones and like i said they're in the process of working on some of these you can kind of tell i think it's kind of neat on this tree here 
don't know if it'll show up too much, but this is the one they ate in the summertime. And when you look at it, you see how it's kind of faded and dull because that sun just faded it out. So we know that this one was done before. And then you see this stuff here, nice and bright. And this was just recently, probably this morning or yesterday that they were working on this tree just by the brightness of the girdling. So we can kind of tell looking at uh, from year to year, was this girdle last year? This is the second year girdle, third year girdle. So we get a really nice good picture of uh, how that works. All right, here we have a cedar tree. And uh, as you can see, they love cedar trees. Jack's really extending here. Um, so cedar trees, I, this is my personal opinion. I, can, I go both ways again, trying to be a good uh, marketer for the cause of goats. Um, there's definitely areas in bluff prairies and such where there's land managers that are working on cedar trees and they can get very thick and um, so obviously you can see on this tree they love to eat the greenery and then if you can see with the bark where they strip the bark but uh, kind of around my property in southern Minnesota and like even here they're, they're, they're kind of few and far in between so they're really not taking over so there are times, and the bird watcher in me really loves all the berries on here and all the, you know, maybe I'll get a varied thrush or something someday, but you know, the cedar waxwings and robins really love the berries and then the cover and the nesting cover. So, so if definitely if you wanted this, so like in the summertime when we had work here, um, they did not strip the bark in the summertime. So that's again, if you have a lot of cedar trees that you want to kind of hang out with and, and not have them destroy like they did here, then maybe more of the summer, or you put some protection around this with a cage or whatnot. But if you want cedar management, you can see that, uh, and these guys aren't re-sprouting. So these are gonna be crispy and this one's done after uh, this treatment here. So just wanted to show what they do with cedar. Yeah, you kind of love the smell too. And so I like cedars, but some land places are, like I said, just uh, could use a little help, a little bit of thinning out. So now we have a, uh, we've already talked about Siberian elm, but I, I forgot, this is a different concept of the bark stripping. And another thing that I think goats and then just the animals that were here, the pronghorn, the elk or whatever you had historically in Minnesota, this is nature's natural pruner. So, so we have the Siberian elm, yeah, it is a Siberian elm, but just my point here is that the main trunk and the, the bulk of the tree, they're not going at or not going after yet. But the, the small suckers, the small, uh, and this goes with every tree, you know, whether it's, uh, <laughs> look at them. Look at that nice little piece that he got off there. So um, whether it's a cottonwood, Siberian elm, whatever it is, they start with the suckers or the smaller branches. So you have time to like, hey, you know, say you wanted nothing to happen to this bigger Siberian elm here. We'll just let them do some pruning. They're helping with the suckers, they're helping the tree overall so that that tree can put its energy going up. And then also kind of bringing up some of the limbs, getting a little bit more light under here. So so just to, just to point out the concept that they're primary, it, when they start going after larger trees, um, that they go after the suckers and the, and the smaller branches first and then as a land manager you have some time to you know either move them to a different area or uh, a different time of season if you wanted to keep them going with that so your bigger trees the ones that have been here for a while you got some time on those so we're trying to bring this one home here and uh we got planes flying all over every time we shoot a video every plane even down in Faribault we're in a fly zone there but it's all part of it. We don't worry about it. The main goal, we're working with animals right here in the city of Burnsville. We got trucks, semis, metro transit, people coming by, taking pictures, enjoying it. You know, everyone, it's just an enjoyable experience for even people as they drive by. So in the beginning part or another part of this video, we had this big tall buckthorn loaded with thousands and thousands of berries and it's the main entrance as you come in here so i've been looking at this one all summer all ever since we started working on this project and 
just like, man, that one's got to come down. Just nothing like having one hanging right out of your front door. So we cut this one down today. We had Katie talk about the berries and that, and you can see how they've just got every berry. We got, you know, earlier footage of them pawing in the snow and picking up each individual berry. Also eating the tender tips. I mean, this probably went out to here. They're eating it back to where it starts to get a little bit more. And now working on the bark. Just look at this beautiful bark. Here's a little bit of remnant that they didn't get to that I've kind of kind of roll over if I can get it to pull over or break off. But just showing what these goats were able to do and and they're still they'll come back over and pick at it in, uh, in a matter of no time. We're walking along, they have their little goat trails and they have their highways and Jeremiah, the my cameraman that's been with me since the beginning here shooting these videos kind of pointed out it's just really cool how they have their own uh, their own network of trails or how they pick the trails or why they do it's almost like a computer where they have a given input and then this is the output that they should do so that's what I really love most about this business I'd have to say in a nutshell is just really trying to crack the code trying to crack the code of why why we're struggling so much in Minnesota to manage a lot of our lands or keep such some of the, the brush that's just growing so thick and fast every year and, and why are we fighting nature so much when nature kind of had a model that was working. And uh, these ghosts have just really opened my eyes to this, uh, this concept and there's nothing more I enjoy finding new areas that they can help or, um, and this is again kind of our, our main our main excitement about this winter and what they did, you know, again, it just still keeps adding more and more data to my firm belief that the reason why we had so much oak savanna is that we had animals, your elk, we had our pronghorn out here all winter long working at this brush. I know, um, you know, there was, fire was definitely a factor, but I feel if you really look at it, unless it was a, a human induced fire, fire just is much more rare on the landscape. And these plants and these sumac and this uh, box elder and this buckthorn, it's just growing way faster than even a yearly fire can keep up with. I mean, and it's tough to get fires, especially how wet we've been here for the last six, seven years. These goats are working year round. We're working, uh, you know, in the rain. We get four inches of rain. They're still out there when you can't get a fire. The, these species of uh, the brush and weed, woodier uh, type vegetation, like I said before, is just, it grows so fast and it's so, uh, you know, and now just really having hope and seeing the sites that we've been working at for five, six, seven years and how beautiful they look and how we don't even really need to use as much goat pressure as we do. Just a one time maybe pass through really lightly for, you know, even our property, um, some of the, the land are always kind of wondering about what's the long term. There's some sites, lots of sun, lots of invasive pressure, or lots of seed bank. We're going to be there for a while. There's some sites that we're flipping and turning and the, uh, the oaks, uh, savanna is, is opening up beautifully and you're getting all that the new flush of growth and you get your grasses and your forbs that are keeping those seedlings suppressed and some of those I only have a hundred goats out there for an hour or two and just make a nice quick sweeping pass with the dog so it's just uh, it's just cool to uh, to be able to keep going with this and, and really glad this concept's growing it's still uh, tricky for many uh, land managers and people that work on the land or just cities in general to kind of understand what we're doing. We get that all the time when people are walking by like, hey dude, what are you doing with goats out there in the wintertime? You know, there's no greenery and we're just kind of conditioned to think like, hey, if the green's not there, the nutrition's not there, they're not happy, you know, they need a shelter, all that type of stuff. And again, as I said before, there are certain animals that are designed in that environment and are made for that environment. But there's definitely, as you can see behind me, animals that are doing great in the wintertime are just eating this buckthorn up. You know, we're out there, whatever we're doing, we're cutting, we're mowing, we're spraying. And we don't like it. And they love it. And they love it. And they're growing well. And they're, they're having babies. I have some goats that are going through the whole season, through whole winter, living on browse, living off nature. We're getting ready to fence our 200 acre project coming up here pretty soon that we've been working at for a couple years now and just really watching that site really uh, open up and develop and uh, just get uh, better and better all the time but uh, 
We'll continue to shoot these videos to help understand if you have any questions or comments, uh, good, bad, ugly, we take it all on the YouTube channel. I try to make sure I eventually get back to all the comments. It might take me a little bit, but I de definitely a, uh, I love that feedback and love having a, a conversation and finding ways that we can uh, all work together to get uh, more land managed, have, uh, have more you know, nesting birds or whatever your objective is. Uh, I just really, really enjoy this. So again, thanks again for tuning in to these videos and be sure to check out our other videos on our channel. And uh, until now, I'll keep working on cracking the, the goat code. Thank you.